Hello, Lisa here. Welcome back to my channel and welcome to this ultimate guide to cardstock. This video is for anybody out there, card enthusiasts of all kinds, who just want to know all the things about cardstock. Like if you have, if you are a purchaser, if you are a connoisseur of game cards, collectible cards, tarot cards, it doesn't matter. If you are excited about or curious about or just want to understand the bones of the card deck, if you want to understand all of this, <laughs> then this video is going to be for you. It's important to point out that I am a tarot enthusiast. So of course, I'm going to be coming at this from the perspective of a tarot card deck lover, but I'm hopeful that this will be a resource that's useful for people, no matter what kind of card deck or card producing you're interested in. But I am a bit of a cardstock snob. I've mentioned that before. And if these samples are any indication, there are a bazillion different kinds of cardstock and finishes and all the things. So I just, I just really wanted to make a video about it. If you're curious why you should care about the cardstock, cardstock is, it is the bones. It is the skeleton of your card deck. It represents the thing beneath all that pretty artwork. It's going to determine how durable or flexible or usable that deck is, how it's gonna hold up to use, how it's gonna feel in your hands. So a couple of disclaimers. It's really important to point out that while I have done a lot of research and talked to a lot of people and companies, and I have definitely done my absolute best to make sure that this is as accurate as possible, this is a vast, vast world. And in, in spite of all of the details I'm about to share with you, I'm really only scratching the surface. So take all this with a grain of salt. Obviously, if you are planning to produce a deck of any kind, make sure that you're checking any information you get through this video with whatever printer or printers you're planning on working with. You know, make sure that you do your due diligence, but I hope this will give everybody kind of a, a jumping off point and maybe even get us on the same page. If you are a deck creator, then stay tuned because I will have a couple of specific tips just for you at the end of this video. And finally, for those of you who are really interested in all the details, uh, but don't wanna have to sit here and take notes while you watch the video, rest assured, I will have a downloadable handout, like a guide for you to print out and keep that summarizes the information I'm gonna be covering in this video. And I will have that linked in the description box down below. I'm going to have lots of timestamps down below, but in essence, we are going to be covering cardstock size, paper type, cores, the paper weight and thickness, finish, and other decorative, decorative considerations. So we're going to be talking about a wide variety of topics, but I've done my best to organize this video so that you can kind of jump around to the sections that interest you, skip the stuff that you don't care about, or move through this video in any way that you want. Although if you are a nerd like me, I highly encourage you to watch it all the way through. Um, and if nothing else, just to like figure out maybe the things that you didn't know and the things that did matter. So with that said, we are going to get into it. Okay, so let's talk size. Now, size is important when it comes to the production quality of a deck because depending on the size of your hands and what size of deck is comfortable for you to hold, shuffle, and handle, the size of a deck will definitely matter. When I was getting ready to do this portion of the video, I thought I was gonna have like three or four sizes. Oh no, there are eight. There are eight different sizes I'm about to show you and these are all decks from my own personal collection. So I'm gonna start from the biggest to the smallest so you can get an idea of how much the size can actually vary across decks within our divination world. So just for perspective, I'm gonna pull out a business card and yes, I'm gonna pull out my wife's because why wouldn't I? <laughs> so also this way, you know exactly where you should go after this video is done. So I'm going to start with Roxy Arts Sideways Tarot. Now this is a jumbo size deck. This is printed at Game Crafter. Now a jumbo size deck is three and a half inches by five and a half inches. So we're gonna just set one of these cards over here so you get an idea of the perspective. The next card deck that I wanna talk about is the Luminous Void. Now this is the shuffle edition and this is an oddball because it's a, a unique shape as well as size. This deck is 3.08 inches by five and a half inches. And so just so you can get an idea, that brings it into a little bit thinner than Roxy's deck here, but about the exact same height at the top. The next size that I wanna talk about, this is a pretty common size and this is an Oracle size. Now, Oracle sizes can vary, but the most common one that I saw was three and a half inches by five inches. And so that brings this deck 
to a little bit narrower than Roxy's deck and definitely shorter than the Luminous Void and Roxy's deck as well. And this one is the Prairie Majesty Oracle. This is the independent edition. All right, and now we're on to the most common size among tarot decks, tarot size cards. This is the Cosmovisions Oracle deck by James R. Eads. And a tarot size, standard tarot size, is 2.75 inches wide by 4.75 inches high. So let me get the actual deck out of the way and stack it up here so we can see. So you can see that this is narrower and shorter than an oracle card size. So the next size down from tarot that I could find is poker size. And the poker size deck that I have in my collection that came to mind immediately is the Sparkly Lenormand. This is by Kimberly Sand, the creator of the Way of the Panda Tarot. This is the cutest darn Lenormand ever. So poker and bridge are pretty common sizes for Lenormand decks particularly, but you can also sometimes get tarot decks in this size. And of course, this is a very common playing card style size. And a poker size comes in at two and a half inches by three and a half inches. So you can see we're getting even smaller here. The next size, this is kind of a fun size because to me this is like if you shrunk tarot, is a trump sized deck. Now this is a trump sized deck. It's the When My Soul Whispered. This is the independent edition, uh, When My Soul Whispered Oracle. And this this deck is 2.45 inches. So just a smidge skinnier than a poker deck, but it's 3.95 inches taller. So it's narrower, but taller than a poker sized deck. So let's add this to our little pile here. So you can see it's going taller than the poker size deck, but it's definitely narrower. The next size, this is, I, I think this is the only deck I have that's in this size, and this also has a similar sort of aspect ratio to the Trump size deck, but this is a pocket sized deck. This is the Ganeshian Village Tarot. And so this card is actually, uh, 2.25 inches wide by 3.85 inches high. But you can see it's just a little bit narrower than the Trump sized deck, but it's about 0.10, you can see it there. It's 0.10 of an inch shorter than a Trump sized deck. So that is the pocket sized. And that brings us to our smallest size that I have currently encountered. And that is the bridge size, which is the exact same as a poker size deck, but just a smidge thinner. So a poker sized deck, that pink card in the background you see there, that sparkly Lenormand, that was two and a half by three and a half inches. Whereas a bridge size is exactly the same height at three and a half inches, but it's two and a quarter inches wide. And for that example, I have here the 1889 Lenormand deck. That's what the box looks like. And the 1889 Lenormand is a bridge size. So it comes in at a quarter of an inch narrower you can see that there. We've got about a quarter of an inch narrower than the poker sized deck. So we have bridge, poker, pocket, trump, tarot, oracle, this oddball one here, and we also have jumbo in the stack on the camera right now. As you can tell, the biggest jumps are from these smaller card sets. So anything from Trump, Pocket, Bridge and Poker to Tarot, and then again to this Jumbo card stock, which this Jumbo one is bigger than most Oracle decks that I have in my collection. Most Oracle decks I would say fall in this size here, like the Prairie Majesty Oracle. And the thing about this, the thing that's important to know about you, if you are a, a somebody who likes to work with and use cards, is you wanna know what sizes of these are most comfortable for you. So if you have a really great deck in your collection that you love to shuffle, it feels like just the perfect size, make note of what size that is. And then when you see other decks in that same size, you might wanna like sit up and take notice. But that is one of the reasons I feel like size is an important factor to be aware of. So the next important factor to talk about is what type of paper your cards are gonna be made of or are made of. And in this, realm, we're gonna be talking about four different types of cardstock because I have four types available to me, readily available to me that I wanna discuss. The first one is cardstock. This is what we, or at least I, have always assumed everything was made out of. Cardstock, of course, they're, they're cards, right? Except not true. So a lot of tarot and oracle decks in our community are made out of cardstock, true, but a lot are also made out of art paper. So one of the questions I wanted to get answered in this process of this video was what the heck is the difference? I reached out to one of the printers that I was working with, shout out to Shuffled Ink, they were amazing in helping me prep for this video. And what Gabe, the production supervisor who I spoke with, what he had to say about it was that cardstock is typically designed to be durable, have a core, and hold up to shuffling and use. Whereas art paper is typically thicker, stiffer, and designed first for display purposes. This kind of shocked me. I was a little thrown. I was like, wait, but don't we always want our tarot and oracle decks to be designed for shuffling and use? Except for, from what I can tell from my own collection, the thickest decks that I own are all art paper. And I wonder if cardstock has a bit of a limit on how thick it can go, and that's why we see some decks going art paper. So when I think of tarot card cardstock, 
this is exactly what I think of. This is Danny Mystic's Mystic Masters Tarot, and it is made of cardstock. So it's it seems it seems like like cardstock, but just for the sake of comparing these different decks, I'm going to show you. We're going to do a bend test. So I'm going to take the card, turn it completely sideways, and I've got a little a marker. So I'm going to bend the card all the way out to this mark on the board here behind me, and then I'm just going to let it go. See how it's like really springy. Now there's more factors than just the fact that it's made out of cardstock, but I just want you to take note of that. Now this is a thinnish, thinner than some of the other ones that I might have in my collection, but this feels like a really nice cardstock. So another deck in my collection that is made out of cardstock Doc is the Sparkly Lenormand by Kimberly San. Now this is a smaller card, so it might be stiffer or feel thicker in a way, like in the way that it handles, just because it's a smaller size. So remember this was a poker sized card. So that can affect the test, so I don't expect this to be like a perfectly scientific situation, but we're gonna do the exact same thing. We're gonna put it on the center line and I'm gonna move it two full inches off to the side, springs back, right back to center. And lastly, I want to show this deck here. This is a deck. This is the Artisan Tarot Convertero reproduction. It's a Marseille deck. Same thing, also made out of cardstock. Now, these are all made out of slightly different uh, paperweights and have different qualities to them, which we'll talk about later. But right now, we're just looking at the qualities of cardstock. Really nice spring on this one. In fact, it's it's got a lot of give and it springs back to its position really nicely. So these are all made out of cardstock right? Okay, so let me set these aside and let's take a look at a few decks that are made out of art paper. So the first of these is this deck here. Now this is the Goddess on Earth Oracle deck by Lisa Lavart. It is beautiful, aesthetically gorgeous in every way, and I've handled this deck. I feel like it shuffles really nicely, but this one is made out of art paper. So let's bring it into this center line, bring it over two, and let go. It seems to spring back just fine. So ask me the difference, you know what I mean, between art paper and cardstock. I don't, you know, this doesn't seem to make it much clearer. These all feel like to, to touch, they feel the same. Now another deck, this one I feel like, I do feel some slight differences with, and that is the Oak, Ash, and Thorn Tarot. This one is also made out of art paper. Now I'm going to bring this one into the center, pull it over two, springs back fine. This feels like a tarot deck to me. It feels like cardstock. It doesn't feel like art, like what I would imagine art paper would feel like. So color me confused, but it is a factor that is different. The Luminous Void, also art paper. Let's do our little spring test here. Into the center, over two, springs back just fine. And they feel bendy and flexible. I just think it's super interesting that all of these decks feel like cardstock to me, and yet half of them were made out of cardstock and half of them were made out of art paper. From what I can tell, none of these decks feel like they're gonna fall apart on us. Let's talk for a second about the two outlier styles of cardstock in my collection. Well, one of them's in Peggy's collection, but that's okay, I'm cheating a little bit. So the first one of these is these cards. This is the Textured Tarot by Lisa McLaughlin Art. I, this is one of my long, long time favorites. I have a full deep dive walkthrough of this deck. I love this deck, I use it all the time, but the cardstock is horrible. <laughs> like subjectively speaking, I don't like it. So uh, Lisa says that this is actually plastic coated Xanta box board. This is the stiffest, least flexible cardstock that I've ever handled. And I'll show you in the bend test here, but this is, Lisa actually says right on her Etsy listing for this deck, it is not designed to be riffle shuffled. And in fact, you cannot riffle shuffle it. And for those curious what I mean by that, a riffle shuffle is when you take the cards and you bend them and then bridge them back. That's a riffle shuffle. Well, it's technically a riffle and then a bridge. These, you cannot do that. They will not, they don't, they don't bend. Like I'm pushing really hard, they don't bend. Now, maybe she picked this because it's designed to be very, very sturdy, but I found it's almost the opposite is the case. Because there's no give to these cards, when I did, early on in my ownership of this deck, try to riffle it, and this was before she had that note on her Etsy shop, or at least I hadn't seen it, um, one of these cards folded completely in half. It like snapped, and it left a wrinkle in the card. Now, over the like years I've owned this deck, I, that wrinkle seems to have smoothed out, and I can't find the card that that happened to, but I was kind of traumatized by it in the moment, like not to be dramatic. I, I'm totally being dramatic, but um, it was really bothersome to me. But let's do the flex test on this. So I'm going to try to bend it back and it's taking quite a bit of pressure. It did spring back, but look at it vibrating. Did you see that? Because it's stiff. It's not actually, it's the card. If you can look, I'm going to try to pinch it really hard. It's not flexing 
like the other cards. Like it's not actually bending. Like for example, here's Danny's card. You'll see the actual card itself is bending. You see that? It's bending. And then I let go. Whereas with the box board, it's almost like it's just the whole card is moving. Do you see the difference? Like it's literally like it's not, it's it's nothing. It's not It's not moving. Now by contrast, the other type of material that we sometimes see tarot cards made out of that I wanted to talk about is plastic. Plastic feels really bizarre. It's like uber flexible. It feels like you could roll it up even and it'll snap back. I don't know how durable plastic is as far as um, bends and, and bows and things like that over the long term, but this is the transparent tarot. I stole this from Peggy's collection for the purposes of this video, but these are uber flexible. And so just to do our little test here, I'll put it in the center line and I can like, I could like just keep going, no problem. Like it's super flexible. Like you're not supposed to be able to do that with your cards. Now the benefit of course of plastic, plastic, not plastic coated, but plastic cards, like if they're made of plastic, the benefit would of course be that they are waterproof, which is fantastic. Um, you could literally wash them and dry them. Um, but that is the only benefit I can think of to plastic. They do have a very, very interesting shuffle. They're, because they're so flexible, they feel like they're gonna fly out of my hands. Like, look how much I can bend them. Oh, and they did just fly. That was not intentional, but that's basically what plastic feels like. All right, it's time to talk about the core of a card. Now, art paper has no core, so I will show an example of a coreless or art paper deck as part of this section of the video, but then we're gonna focus on the different types of cores. Now, there are four different primary types that I encountered. Gray core, white core, also sometimes called ivory core, blue core, and black core. Now, in finding out or digging into what the differences are between these different cores, when it comes to cardstock, gray core is sort of the baseline standard. That's like what any cardstock should have, at least a gray core. You step up in quality when you move up to white core. Then you step up in quality again when you go to blue core. And when you move to black core, you're at casino grade quality. But black core has an additional feature and that is that it is designed so that there's no show through of the design. That's why black core paper or cardstock is very popular and common for casino grade cards. Because of course in poker, you don't want somebody to be able to see what cards somebody is holding no matter how pale the design of the card is. So black core is highest quality and also is designed Designed to not show through the design. Here is a coreless card. This is the Oak, Ash, and Thorn. You can see we have a pretty vivid design on the front and we have a very light backing. Now in regular everyday use, I've never noticed any show through despite the fact that this is a coreless card, but I have my cell phone flashlight here and you'll be able to see when the light gets behind it. See how you can see a bit of that pattern up in the corner? So imagine if this were a playing card or maybe a game card you wouldn't want that show through if it could affect the way the game is gonna be played. And of course, if you could see it through the center, depending on how busy the artwork is, you wouldn't necessarily want that either. But then let's take a look at a deck that is made of a, has a white core, and that is the Sparkly Lenormand deck. So this deck has a white core, and you could potentially actually still get some show through. And when I get this at just the right angle, you would be able to tell that this is the whip card. That's because the core of this card is white, but it is supposed to be a superior core to a standard gray core, and certainly superior to no core as far as durability and flexibility of the card goes. And then we have blue core. Here is Danny Mystic's Mystic Masters Tarot. This is a Make Playing Cards deck, really lovely, and it has a blue core inside of it. Again, remember, this is the highest quality core other than uh, black core, and as you can tell, you could still see some of what's happening on the front of the card. See, it has the word withdraw. I don't know if you can tell, but I can actually highlight. But what's really interesting to me is you can tell it's blue core because when I shine the light through it, my light turns kind of purplish into this cream background. Check that out. I don't know if the camera's gonna pick it up properly, but that is a blue core. That's why we're seeing that purplish looking light. Cool, hey? I don't know why I'm such a nerd, but I am a nerd. Thanks for putting up with me. And just see. So the Artisan Tarot, um, Conva Reproduction is a black core deck and it's white with um, lots of white backing. Check it out. No show through. And because I can't help myself and I'm super curious and I have these samples. I have a sample here of a casino card quality make playing cards. This is a linen finish black core. I wanna see what it looks like. I interrupt this geeky video to say that if you are finding value in what you are seeing, click the like button.
Oh my God, I can't. There we go, look! Oh my God, that's so cool. So you can actually see the black core in there. Isn't that cool? Okay, so we know that the pear tree court is their blue core, which is their, I think it's S30. So let's check your S30 cardstock and see. Oh my God, I can't believe I'm tearing cards. This is so bizarre, but it's a sample, it's a sample, it's okay. <gasps> there we go, look, it's blue. So that is a blue core cardstock. Okay, how freaking cool is this? Now I wanna know what all these other ones are. Okay, let's check out their Superior Smooth because I'm not sure what color core is in this one. Let's find out. <gasps> Black as well. So the Superior Smooth cardstock from Make Playing Cards, which is what Danny's Mystic Masters is made of, also has a black core. Okay, this is, this is fun. I really wanna keep doing this. Oh, here's another plastic. Those aren't gonna have a core. Okay, that's more Superior Smooth. Let's see, what about their A35 Thick Standard cardstock? Now, I could probably find this out by looking it up on Make Playing Cards rather than tearing my cards, but look, this one doesn't have a color at all. I would argue that this is a white core. I wonder if we're gonna see a gray core. Are any of these gray core? Let me see if I've got anything in here that looks like it might be. Ready to look to the S30. S27, I think this is their cheapest cardstock. So let's check this one. This is their promotional cardstock. Oh, it's blue core. I wasn't expecting that. Okay, cool. Okay, so that is what the cores look like. They are a layer in between the top and bottom layer of your cardstock. So that is what the blue core looks like. And that is what the black core looks like. I think it's also super interesting. I don't know if you noticed this, but the blue core tore differently than the black core. And the black core seemed to have a more even tear, like it didn't peel, it just tore. Super interesting. And it makes me wonder if this is a factor that goes into when cards have a tendency to peel versus to not. Because these black core ones didn't want to peel, whereas the white and the blue core ones did want to peel. Okay, let me clean this mess up and we're gonna talk about paperweight next. Okay, fess up, did you skip right to this section? <laughs> this is the area that I think all of us who review decks on YouTube at least, or at least the vast majority of us, of us seem to focus real hard on paper thickness. So here's where we have to have a discussion about terminology because I definitely misunderstood this concept for a long, long time. And now that I understand it, I wanna clarify it for those of you that find this really confusing. So you'll hear a lot of us, myself specifically included, use the term GSM a lot to talk about paper thickness. GSM doesn't refer to thickness at all. It refers to the weight of the paper, grams per square meter. So this is the most common way to measure paper outside of the US and in the tarot community or in the cardstock community, it seems to be the most common term we use. One of the reasons for that is because it's also the most universal. The other common way to measure or quantify paper is its weight in pounds. Here's where this gets really tricky. What that actually means is that is the weight in pounds, a ream of the parent paper ways. So the parent size of, of paper or the ream size of paper can vary depending on the type of paper. And this creates a whole lot of confusion. Whereas with GSM, no matter what kind of paper, it's one by one square meter, how much it weighs. So it gets a lot more apples to apples when you're talking about paper weight. Now, again, that's how much the paper weighs. So if you're talking about different kinds of paper, it can get really nuanced as well because a paper that is pressed very firmly could be much heavier at a one by one square meter whereas a paper that is not pressed quite so firmly could be much lighter. So you you might get the idea that thickness and weight aren't exactly identical but because in the tarot and the card community we're typically talking about either cardstock or we're talking about art paper there's only very slight differences. So typically a 300 GSM card is going to be thicker, thinner in feel than a 350 GSM card. But again, there are still other factors. So I have got in front of me a bunch of different examples of cards ranging from 300 GSM all the way up to 400 GSM. And I'm gonna show you some of the differences that I can feel and see in my own cards. And when we get into the next section, which is all about paper finishes, you'll be able to see how other things can affect the thickness as well. But for starters, let's start with 300 GSM which in my personal tarot collection is the thinnest that I have. And one of those decks I have that is 300 GSM is Danny's Pear Tree Oracle. So it is an Oracle deck. It's not as big as a tarot deck, but that should give you an idea of how thin 
the cardstock is, right? It flexes really nicely, it shuffles really nicely. A deck that I was shocked to learn is 300 GSM is the Cosmovisions by James R. Eads. Now this does not feel super thin. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't feel super thin. So what the heck? Now these aren't the same number of cards. So just so you're not like going side by side here, but even just feeling the cards, this one is much stiffer and snappier. And this one is much more flexible. What gives? So there are a few differences between these decks that could account for the difference in thickness of the actual physical card and the difference in feel, despite the fact that they're both made of the exact same paperweight. And I'm going to venture a guess that these have different types of finishes on them, as well as the fact that because this deck is gilded, it may also add some additional weight to the card or make it feel more substantial and a little stiffer because of course gilding will change the way the deck feels. That's my suspicion, but who really knows, right? I don't have the specs on every single deck in my collection, but I thought it was interesting that these two decks, which feel so different, are both 300 GSM. Now, before we move on, we've got a shuffle. So shuffling the pear tree, that's what that looks like. And shuffling our 300 GSM Cosmovisions. Lovely, both of them. Next up, we have 305 GSM, and this is kind of an oddball weight. Most times you see 300 and then a jump to 310, but the Sideways Tarot is a Game Crafter printed deck, and they have this 305 GSM cardstock. So 305, this one does feel thin, so I suspect that there's nothing else. It also feels kind of floppy, and I think that's partly because it, they're so big. These, again, were those jumbo-sized cards. So the bigger a card gets, the more bend it tends to have. That's just physics. I don't know which part of physics, because I'm not a scientist, but it's physics. So this has kind of an unsatisfactory shuffle, plus it's also a fairly small deck because it's majors only, but it's very floppy feeling at 305. Doesn't feel crappy. Like it doesn't feel like poor quality. It's just very floppy. Next, we're moving up to 310. And this is a very common GSM for tarot cards. It feels in this little pocket size deck quite thick and substantial. And in fact, that's something to keep in mind is that smaller decks, as I mentioned, are going to feel stiffer, whereas bigger decks are going to feel floppier or bend more bendable. So if you're concerned about like how easy it is to shuffle, Think about using a thinner cardstock or going for a thinner cardstock when it's going to be a smaller deck because it'll feel it'll feel quite thick already versus a bigger deck. So for example, these two decks are both 310 GSM. This one and this one are both tarot decks. So they have the same number of cards. And let's just see their thicknesses. This one comes in a bit thicker. Interesting could have to do with other factors, which we'll, again, we'll get into, but this is a very similar, a very similar thickness, but let's check out the shuffle. So on this stiff little pocket size deck, this is the Ganeshian Village Tarot, by the way. Oops. Not tons and tons of bend, but it works, it does its thing. Whereas this deck, which doesn't, fe doesn't have that resistance, it's a standard tarot size. Lots of bend, lots of easy bridge. This feels lovely. This feels a lot like playing card stock. Super nice to shuffle. The next GSM I have in my collection is 320. And I've got two decks with 320 GSM that I wanna show you. The first of these is the Divine Feminine Tarot. Um, this is so lovely to touch and to shuffle. It's got a lot of flexibility to it. Feels somehow thinner in some way than the uh, artisan convertero that I was just handling, but it, sh it has some resistance when you shuffle it and you can definitely feel that in the bridge. The other deck I have that's the exact same GSM 320 is this little rare triumphs deck. And this is definitely, this feels exactly like playing cards to me. It feels thin, but it's really flexible and snappy. Uh, and this one, love, oh my gosh, that's like, yeah, that's lovely. But this is also a poker size deck but it is lovely, just lovely. So that is the Rare Triumphs deck. 330 to 350 is, in my experience, the most common current indie card stock that we see. This seems to be the sweet spot between like durability, sort of thickness and heft in a deck and usability. So let's take a look at 330 GSM. And I've got two examples to show you. The first of these is the Space Tarot. This was a sample sent to me by Shuffled Ink. And this is a 330 GSM space themed sort of pip deck. 
and of course Danny's Mystic Masters, which is make playing cards printed, and it is also 330 GSM. Now these both feel really nice quality. They have that kind of thickness that makes you feel like you've got something substantial in your hands. And as you can see, these are very, very similar in size, almost identical, I would say. In fact, I'm, I can't easily slide off the top of one deck to the other, so they're probably identical. With that in mind, let's take a look at the shuffle. So this is the Space Tarot, 330 GSM, really nice. Again, they feel kind of snappy. They feel snappier than the cards at 310, this tarot sized cards at 310 and 320 felt. Lovely. And Danny's Mystic Masters. This one's a little more broken in, so I don't know if it's entirely fair as a comparison. But again, this isn't science. This is just nerdiness. And that was a lovely shuffle as well. This next one is probably my favorite cardstock of all time, despite it being incredibly slippery. Uh, this comes from Expert Playing Card Company, the printing house. This is the Playful Heart Tarot by Zara or Kitten Chops. And this is the exact same cardstock as you'll find on the Pagan Otherworlds Tarot. I have both decks, but this one is definitely closer to my heart. This one has 340 GSM. So there are more features to this deck other than just its, its weight, but 340 feels to me to be a really sturdy, lovely paperweight. So I really enjoy this 340 GSM. Next up, we have 350 GSM, and in 350 GSM, we have the Blooming Cat Tarot. Now this was sent to me as a sample by Print Ninja, the printer that obviously printed the Blooming Cat Tarot. And I have the Sparkly Lenormand here also. These are, these are both 350, and again, it's worth noting that this deck, this is the same paperweight. This one is feels a lot stiffer, and again, that can be partly the size. They are very, very similar, and we are comparing Tarot to Lenormand, so we can't do the side by side, but, I just wanted to give you an idea that the, each GSM can feel vastly different depending on all the other factors that go into the deck. And I think that's something that we sometimes forget when we're reviewing decks. And this is such a great example of that because these cards feel very, very different. So let's shuffle, oh, I kind of don't want to because it's in order right now, but let's shuffle the Blooming Cat Tarot. Oh, see that one feels quite stiff actually to shuffle. So as we get into 350 and higher, you'll notice that they don't have the same kind of bend and flex to them. It is nice, it's smooth, but it is stiff. And I've definitely already noticed in the Sparkly Lenormand that the shuffle is pretty stiff. This is a deck that feels like it would just be nicer to hand over hand. And that's what starts to happen as you get into the thicker or heavier GSM cardstock. Now you've already heard me babble on about the textured tarot's box board cardstock, box board, I guess it's not even cardstock, the box board. This is 395 GSM. And you can really tell when you hold this next to say Danny's Mystic Masters, what a chunker that is. Now again, this is box board, whereas this is cardstock, but it's quite a difference and it makes this deck harder to handle. Let's talk about 400 GSM. I've got two here that feel very different. And again, I tried to pick examples that felt different because I think it illustrates the point. We have Oak, Ash, and Thorn here, which is a lovely shuffle, but it is quite stiff. And then we have an Oracle deck. This is the Goddess on Earth Oracle deck. And this deck, you know, these aren't tarot, so doing that doesn't help as much. But let's take a look at the actual feel. They both feel substantial. This is a bigger card, so it's going to have a lot more give to it just because physics. Whereas this one still feels quite malleable, to be honest. But again, this one, neither one of these have a core. So they're going to have that, that sense of flex to them. But let's do a quick shuffle and just see what we think. I have broken this deck in quite a bit. So again, I don't know how fair that is, but I have actually used Goddess on Earth quite a bit as well. So maybe it's not so unfair. It feels nice. It is a little bit meatier to get your hands around. So if you have smaller hands, you might find such a thick deck a little hard to grab enough cards to do a proper riffle shuffle with. Uh, Goddess on Earth is a smaller stack of cards, but they are bigger in physical size. And this one actually feels even stiffer to me than Oak Ash and Thorn. So that's interesting, right? A little bit less give, it feels like here, but it is a little bit of a workout for your hands. And as you get into like 400 GSM, you're gonna find that that's true. A quick note about thickness, because there is actually one measurement that does measure actual physical thickness, and that is points. So you have 32 point, which is a very, very, very thick. Do you see that? 
18 point, 18 point, 5 point, 14 point, 16 point. So if you've encountered this term, the point term, what that is a measurement of is the actual measurable thickness. So there's a measuring device called a caliper and a caliper pinches the item that you're measuring and it tells you how thick something is. So a card that is 18.5 points means it is 18.5 thousandths of an inch thick. Okay, so all things being equal, if we had five different tarot decks and they were all the exact same paper style, had the same core, were the same thickness, they would feel the same, right? And this is one of actually I've discovered the biggest differences that come about in the way that a deck feels and that is its finish. So when cards are made, there is the paper itself, there's the core that it's made out of, there's the printing process where the color, the ink, etc., is applied to the cards, and then there's the finishing process. This is the last stage in production, or one of the last stages, where something is applied to the cards to give them their final look and feel, and that is going to give you either uh, a matte or a not shiny finish, a super shiny finish, something in between, or even a velvety to the feel finish, which you'll often hear us call rose petal finish, which I've discovered absolutely no printer I've encountered calls it that. <laughs> so there's different names for it. Different printers will use different names for many of these finishes, but there are a number of different ways to apply a finish to the card. The two primary ways that a finish is applied to a finished printed card is a liquid finish or a laminate finish. So for example, you have this piece of card that's been printed on and it's so it's run through, it's had the ink applied. Here's an example of something that is not coated or finished at all. This is an uncoated plain cardstock. So this is just the paper itself. There's nothing protecting it. If you spill something on it, it's going to soak right in. This is just plain uncoated paper or uncoated craft in this particular case. A liquid can be applied. There's three different kinds of liquids that I found were commonly used in the card printing industry. Varnish, which looks like it was the standard, like that's what everybody was using, which seems to be the least eco-friendly option. It is a liquid that is applied and then cured. Then there is a UV varnish, which is UV cured. And I, from my understanding is that the UV cured, so let me just give you an example here. So this is an example of a matte varnish, right? A matte means it's going to have very little light reflection. You can see as I point it to the card, we're only getting the slightest sheen down here where there's some ink. But for the most part, this is a matte varnish. So this has been a liquid that was applied to this card to give it a final matte finish. And when I hold these next to each other, you can see the difference. The one that's been finished is much smoother. Um, it has some protection, whereas this one is completely unprotected. Then you can have a satin varnish, right? So this one, as you can see, look at the difference. Matte versus satin versus uncoated. You can see as the light hits, this will reflect some light. Now this is what everything used to be. In tarot cards, they used to all have this kind of a finish, right? They were sort of satiny, not super glossy, but not matte either. And these were all, these are all done. These two are here are done with varnish. Now UV, UV is most commonly, or at least it was most commonly available in a super high gloss. So again, here's a satin, here's a matte, and then here is UV, and you can see the UV is very glossy. You can see my full shape of my ring lot, which, light, which is off to the side of me. You can see how shiny that is compared to the matte and the satin, right? So UV is also, though, available in matte. Uh, I don't have an example from this particular company. This is a company called Cat Print, which sent me a set, sent me a set of samples. But um, I wanted to give you an idea. Now, from what I understand, UV, when it is applied, it is then cured with UV light, and it tends to be harder and more prone to cracking. You can't actually use a UV coating if you're planning to fold or stamp, including applying foil stamping, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But it because it's prone to cracking, it does apply, it seems like it applies even more durability than a standard uh, varnish. It seems like it applies a little bit more stiffness to the card. So a card that has been coated with a UV coating may actually feel like it has more structure than one that has had a varnish applied. That's just based on my kind of layman's understanding of the different types of liquid coatings that are applied. Now, other than liquid coatings, you also have laminations. So these are liquid coatings. This one is a varnish, this is a varnish, and this is a UV cured. This is our uncoated card up here. You also have laminates. Now, laminates are exactly what they sound like, right? You have lamination. If you laminate something, you're run, you're applying a film to each side of it, or unless you were only laminating one side, which we wouldn't typically see in tarot, but you would, you have a film that's applied. Now, of course, that film is going to add a physical layer of protection, not just a liquid layer, and that physical layer can vary in thickness. So do you remember earlier when we were looking at the Cosmovisions 
tarot or oracle rather for example next to i believe it was the pear tree oracle by danny mystic those two decks were both 300 gsm but the cosmovisions felt substantially thicker and stiffer and my suspicion although i don't know this for sure is that that is because the cosmovisions is probably matte laminated and that laminate would have added an additional layer of thickness again i could be wrong but this is what i've started to piece together from my research in this topic so for example in lamination, you can also have matte, such as we have here, very little light reflection, and you can have super, super glossy. See my shape of my ring light here in this gloss laminate. You can also have, and I believe this is possible with either a liquid coating or a laminate, but you can have this velvety feel. Now in this case, it's called soft touch. One of the most common ways that that sort of rose petally finish or sort of velvet touch um, cardstock, it almost feels rubberized. It's and different ones can feel different, right? But this one is a example of soft touch lamination, and it feels like even more matte than matte. So, for example, you can see where the matte card will sometimes catch ever so slight amounts of light. And in fact, probably our best example was this matte varnish where that black spot would catch some light. You'll notice that in soft touch, that's this card here, it won't catch any light at all. That's one of the benefits of soft touch in my opinion is that it's pure matte. You can't get any more matte in my opinion than that sort of soft touch velvety matte. It's, it often has a very rich, um, black to it. You can even see that here if you look at the black in the matte soft touch versus the just plain matte laminate. Um, but uh, you will definitely notice that a matte laminated card is going to feel thicker automatically. So here's, do we have apples to apples here? I don't think we do because they're all different thicknesses. But okay, this is a good th thickness. Th these are both 18 point, which means they are both 18 thousandths of an inch thick. But you can even visibly see the thickness on the soft touch laminated card. That soft touch laminate has certainly added thickness to the card. So you can have two different GSMs, but if one has been laminated and one has not, one has had a liquid coating applied, for example, it will feel thinner. So this is just a bit of an overview. We're gonna look at some deck examples of different types of coatings so you can get a feel for what that looks like. But the last one I wanted to cover that I don't have a sample from this particular company is Aqueous coatings. Now aqueous are applied much the exact same way as a varnish is applied. So they're going to give you similar effects to these varnishes you see here. Aqueous coatings, which are becoming more popular these days, aqueous are water-based and they are much more environmentally friendly. So creators that are looking to implement more environmentally friendly factors may go for an aqueous finish. And I have some examples of that in front of me. In my opinion, I have seen no discernible difference between the feel of an aqueous versus a varnish. So the aqueous coating, if it's more environmentally friendly, to me as a user, I would much prefer to invest in a deck that has an aqueous coating over one that has a traditional varnish, simply because now I know aqueous is more friendly to our environment. So let's take a look at some deck examples. The first deck that I wanna show you guys is an aqueous matte coating. Now this was a sample deck that was sent to me, um, it's called the Atomic Age Tarot, and this was sent to me by Shuffled Ink, one of the card printers that I was working with for this video. And this is an example of a 330 GSM smooth finish cardstock, and it has a matte aqueous finish. Really matte aqueous finish is just, again, a more environmentally friendly matte finish. So let me just get it into the light. You can see there's my ring lights right over there. So if this were glossy, you'd see the shape of my ring light on these cards. So that gives you an idea of the level of reflect in a aqueous matte finish. So that's what we're looking at there. Now, one of the things I wanna do to show you how these finishes behave is do a fan test because the finish is one of the most important factors in how a deck will fan. The fanning will also give you an indication of how the cards will come back together when they shuffle, but I will also shuffle. So why don't I do this? I will shuffle this matte aqueous finish and then I'll fan it for you. Cards come together pretty nicely. It feels fairly smooth and there's our fan. So that was pretty easy to do. It wasn't too clumpy. They feel like they're fairly smooth. Uh, it didn't feel too grippy or sticky, and that is the aqueous math. Okay, this next deck that was sent to me by the creator is the Prairie Majesty Oracle. This is lovely. This particular deck has a UV matte finish. So let's take a look at the sheen. So when I compare this to the aqueous matte, let's just take a look. There may be ever so slight, let's hold them right next to each other, they seem to me, actually, as I watch that band of light move up and down, to have the exact same amount of light reflect. So there's no discernible difference. But in feel, 
In my opinion, the UV matte feels a little bit smoother, just ever so slightly, a little bit smoother than the aqueous matte. It's almost as though, I don't know how to describe it, but it's, it's, it's very slight. My suspicion is that this one will have an even smoother feeling fan, despite being very, very matte. But let's give it a shuffle first and see how the cards come back together. Keep in mind the gilding obviously affects things as well. Nice, they slid back together perfectly. And let's give it a fan. Oh, okay, that was not expected. I expected it to fan just as smoothly. I wonder if they're almost too slippery. Let's try again. Yeah, it's actually still a little bit clumpy. That surprised me. I expected this one to fan nicer than the other one just based on the way that it feels in the hand. But it's a very, very lovely finish. I personally really like it. And I think between the two, now I'm not sure. The UV finish does give a little bit, it feels like it gives a little bit more stiffness to the cards, which makes sense because what I read about UV is that can be a little bit of a harder coating. So super interesting. All right, so next is matte lamination. And that's where we come to the oak, ash, and thorn. And I will say aesthetically by feel, man, this one feels sort of um, butterier. <laughs> I wish I knew how else to describe that. But the matte lamination I find just feels not waxy, but it, it has a texture. That's the matte lamination. This one feels like there's more, just ever so slightly more texture. This one feels, again, ever so slightly smoother. I, I might be just terrible at describing this, but let's do a light reflect test using all three of these. So again, this was, uh, this was a aqueous matte, this is a UV matte, and this is the matte lamination. And actually, holding them together like this, it appears to me like the matte lamination reflects the least amount of light of these three. That's my opinion, but there you go. Okay, that brings us, that brings us next to the Mystic Masters. Now this is printed at Make Playing Cards and this one has a smooth finish. Now smooth and semi-gloss I found tend to be kind of synonymous and you'll see the difference here. So this is a smooth or semi-gloss finish and you can see it reflects just a bit more light. It's almost impossible to tell, but you can see just a bit more of the shape of my ring light in this card versus this card. It's ever so slightly more reflective than the matte UV. And let's just take a look next to the matte aqueous because these are very similar shades as well. Yeah, just a little bit more reflex. So I would call this a semi-gloss, but Make Plain Cards calls it a smooth finish. These have a lovely, lovely slide and shuffle. And they do have almost that sort of waxy feel to them. Very nice and smooth. And a beautiful, pristine slide and shuffle without being too, too slippery. So that is a semi-gloss finish. The beautiful playful heart tarot now here's where we get into a different category entirely so let's take a quick pause away from the actual coating that's applied and talk for a moment about another style of finishing that i think adds something special to cards and that is linen textured finish now linen texture is applied through an embossing process embossing is usually where you like literally physically change the shape or the the texture of the cards so linen cards have a waffle pattern which hopefully you can detect in this card as I get the light on it. So that waffle pattern creates little air pockets on the card which means that they actually are very very slippery and slidey and when they shuffle they just shuffle seamlessly together because that air just provides glide between the cards. So when I shuffle a linen cardstock you'll notice that it tends to be very like you can hear the air. Did you hear the difference? Like you can literally hear the air in the shuffle when I bridge it. Beautiful, right? And of course these fan perfectly and beautifully. Just a step better, I would say, than the smooth card stock of the Mystic Masters. The other thing is that I've noticed that linen cards can be glossy, semi-gloss, or matte. Matte is least common, but they do certainly exist. Whereas the, the linen cards that I'm more used to seeing do tend to have a semi-gloss finish, such as this one. Again, you can kind of almost see the shape of my ring light in this semi-gloss finish. And just to compare semi-gloss, semi-glosses here, these feel like they have a very similar amount of light reflect versus if I put it next to this UV, 
This one is definitely more reflective, catches more light than the UV coated, matte coated. So that is a linen finish. And let's look at a glossy finish. So this is the Numinous Tarot. This is the older printing, not the more recent one, which is matte, I believe. But this one, it has a aqueous gloss finish. So it's that more environmentally friendly glossy finish. And as you can see, you can immediately see the full shape of my ring light. So these are the most, glossy finishes tend to be the most reflective. So of course, if you take photos or you do use your cards on camera in any way, you'll find that they'll be a lot more reflect, they'll catch a lot more light. If you're not recording or taking photos of your cards, that reflection may not be all that important to you. And glossy cards can actually really make the colors on the cards pop, which is super nice. But the drawback, of course, is that reflection can sometimes mean glare. And depending on where you read or how you read your cards or the light source near where you read your cards, that can be a distraction. But some people genuinely love glossy cardstock. I happen to not be one of them, again, mostly because I do so much on camera, but I do think that they feel nice and they look nice. But let's see how they shuffle and how they fan. So that's how they came together. You can see there's just ever so slightly a little bit of stick. That stick, um, I find sometimes happens with glossy cards, can be worse or better depending on the type of gloss. But I find that when they're glossy, they do tend to cling a little bit. And sometimes when they're brand new, you might find that the cards literally feel stuck together. That does happen, especially with some mass market decks that have a gloss treatment. If you get a deck that is glossy that feels like the cards are stuck together, do not just peel them apart. Quick trick, hold the whole deck like this, like a big brick, and gently flex the deck back and forth. And you'll feel that gloss kind of unsticking and loosening and just do that you'll hear almost like a like a gentle cracking sound <laughs> sounds terrible but you will and then you can separate your cards um, it's very common with gloss to have some of that stick together because shiny surfaces stick to other shiny surfaces it's again probably some kind of physics thing but that is gloss and that's this was an aqueous gloss lastly let's talk about soft touch style. Now, again, it's most commonly called soft touch, but I've seen it called from different printers or heard of it being called from different printers thanks to all the information I got from others for this video. I've heard of it being called um, skin touch, velvet touch, soft touch. Um, uh, there was another one, a scuff, low scuff or something like that. But the, the common denominator between all the different kinds of soft touch finishes is that they have a texture to them. They feel almost like the surface of a rose petal, which I think is where that term rose petal finish came from. And if I were to guess, I actually think that term originated with the true black tarot, which to my knowledge was one of the first independent tarot decks to use a soft touch finish on their cards. And I remember in the Kickstarter campaign that it being described as feeling a lot like a rose petal and everybody was just enamored and fascinated. But this is a soft touch that has been applied with lamination. So this actually has a, a sheet of film applied to the front and the backs of the cards that are giving it that feel. So we're getting some physical protection in the form of lamination, but also that beautiful soft touch. Now I've had several decks with this kind of a feel to them. And I will say that some feel sort of grippier or more textured than others. This particular one, this lamination one feels very smooth, not as like heavy as some of the other decks that I've handled. I do also find that decks with this kind of finish do break in and get a little smoother over time as you use them. But let's take a look at the shuffle. So I just did the initial shuffle. Let's see how they come together. And that's how they came together. So a little bit like the gloss, a little bit like more, they didn't, they stuck, right? I have to kind of smush them together. That stickiness, I feel like with the glossiest cards and with the most matte cards, that's where you're most likely to have those sticking issues when you shuffle the deck back together. So that is how that one shuffled. So let's see how it fans. And this one, that literally just happened. I'm not, I'm not making that up. On a cloth, I feel like this actually spreads really well, but I might actually have to put my hand underneath to give it a starting point. And it did do that. I Again, when I did this on my reading cloth in my video, I feel like I remember it fanning better, but maybe not. It is sticking. And if you like to fan your cards, that may be an issue. They do like to cling to one another and kind of move as a, as a group or as a clump. That may not be what you want. I do particularly love this deck and love 
almost everything about it, so I'm a little biased. I was a little shocked just then to see it fan so poorly, but that is a common problem with soft touch feel decks, is that velvety feeling, that rubbery feeling does keep them kind of clinging to each other instead of sliding and spreading out nicely, which also means sometimes that can affect the way that they shuffle, especially if you hand over hand shuffle. So when you riffle shuffle, like I was just about to do again, when you riffle shuffle, you're, you're separating the cards by the way that you drop them on the table. But if you hand over hand, you'll notice the cards tend to clump, which means you're gonna get a much clumpier shuffle if you hand over hand shuffle. And the cards are either super glossy and sticky or this soft touch lamination. And that might be an important factor to consider when you're either making a deck or buying a deck. And finally, let's talk about one more soft touch deck I have in my collection, and that is the Tolku Oracle. This one was applied with a UV coating. So it's a soft touch, but it was applied with UV. Feeling wise, these feel very similar. Um, this one feels um, thicker, and I think that's because it's lamination, right? Whereas this one is a coating. So light wise, I don't know if I did the light test previously, but let's check the light. There's zero, like no matter how I turn it, there is no reflection or sheen or anything. These tend to just absorb light. They don't reflect them at all. Again, that is one of the benefits of a soft touch finish. So let's give this one a shuffle. This one is the UV applied soft touch. And it feels a little slicker to me than the Goddess on Earth did. This is the Tolku Oracle. Oh, I, sh I sh forgot to show the, the way that they came back together. Let me do that. Okay. Okay, without pushing them back together, that is how they landed. And just for comparison, let me grab one that I know shuffles perfectly. That would be the Playful Heart Tarot because it's got those air pockets, right? So there's a lot of really good slide. Let me do a quick shuffle and like show how they come back together with this one. I shouldn't have to touch them at all. See the difference? So they can't, they, they just, they just naturally slide back together. Whereas with these, let me, let me show this again. Maybe I can even do it in slow motion. Let's see if I can slow it down in my editing. So you can see the shuffle in slow motion of a linen finish. Let's see the bridge in slow-mo. Versus, let's see a soft touch bridge in slow motion. So let's shuffle it first. Let's see the bridge in slow-mo. So it took me a few taps to bring the cards together at the end there. And that to me is the difference. Now again, this will break in over time, um, but between the soft touch that was applied with a lamination, which is this one here, and a soft touch that was applied with UV coating here, they feel pretty similar. These ones feel a little bit grippier than these ones. Let's do our fan of the Tolku Oracle and see if we get a better result. They still did the thing, but <laughs> let me see if I can help it along like I tried to do the other one. So let me put my hand underneath so I have a starting point, a little bit better. Uh, on a cloth, again, rather than a smooth surface like this, I find that they do fan much nicer. Quick summary of finishes. Can be applied as a liquid, can be applied as a laminate, and can give you any variety of finishes from matte to semi-matte or semi-glossy to very, very matte, such as in the case of soft touch, or very, very glossy, such as in the case of a really shiny UV or aqueous gloss. The final consideration is decorative bling, accents, considerations, things you might or might not care about at all when it comes to either purchasing or making decks. The first of these that I wanna talk about is metallic gilding. Now this is a gilding that is incredibly shiny, almost with a mirror-like reflection. This is the gilding that, while beautiful, I have found personally can feel the sharpest when you're shuffling. It feels like there's a sharp edge on the cards. And I've also found that this super shiny gilding is the most prone to chipping over time. Uh, and I find that it's not too terrible to shuffle, but if this cardstock were thicker, eh, it's still mildly uncomfortable, I'll be honest. I would prefer uh, not to have to deal with this really, really metallic gilding. It is really pretty, especially when it's brand new, but when it's not new and it's worn and it's starting to chip, it kind of, I don't know, some people might like that worn look. I am not a fan, but it is really pretty to look at. Another example of a shiny gilding is this gorgeous rose gold of the Prairie Majesty Tarot. This one is so, so pretty. And I think the, the color makes me want to overlook the feeling of it, but it is still that very, very high shine, 
kind of metallic feeling, like very metallic feeling kind of card. Another kind of shiny gilding, which I think is kind of fun, and I'm willing to overlook the shiny metal feel of it uh, for it is holographic gilding. So this is my This Might Hurt Tarot, and this is a very well-worn deck, and it's kind of hard to capture, now that the deck is more worn, it's harder to catch the rainbow, but it's definitely, it's definitely there, but you can definitely see that I have really, really worn this deck in. So it's a lot, oh, there we go. I think I just spotted it. There's the rainbow right there. <laughs> so much easier to see when they're new and shiny. Um, and I guess that's an important reminder to me that as much as I go gaga over a holographic edge, it does get harder and harder to notice as the cards break in. So that's worth noting. The kind of metallic gilding I'm the least fond of is this kind here. Now this is a copy of the Ellis deck. This was the, the Ellis Tarot, Ellis deck tarot. This is the fifth edition beautiful deck. I love this deck. I have a, a deep dive of it. Now this one is quite nicely broken in and as you can see there's a bit of a, a sort of modeled appearance to the edges. That is because this particular gilding when I got it was very very glittery. It was a glittery golden gilding which was really annoying in the beginning because it shed terribly. I would handle this deck and I would get glitter all over my hands. There would be glitter on the table. It was a little bit annoying. Now that the deck is pretty well broken in it's actually kind of a lovely finish I just wish I could have had that finish without going through the annoying glittery stage. So this is my least favorite kind of gilding. It's the kind of gilding that to me feels the cheapest when I touch it. It doesn't have the same sort of wow factor, but again, now that it's broken in, I don't mind it at all. It doesn't feel as sharp or shiny as the shiny metallic gildings that I just showed you. But my favorite kind of gilding is matte, or I, I call this shimmery matte. Um, and it's one of my favorites, I guess I should say. So an example of a shimmery matte gilding is what we have here on the Luminous Void Tarot. So it's golden in color. It has a very slight about amount of reflect to it. So we often call this antique gold or um, we'll call it matte gold. In reality, it's probably more a color than a shine on this deck, but it looks gold and it doesn't feel sharp. It feels sturdy. I don't have any noticeable chipping despite heavy use of this deck. I can't see anywhere in the gilding at all. It's, it's held up very, very well. Another example of matte, I would, what I would call matte metallic gilding is the Goddess on Earth tarot that has this beautiful copper matte gilding, but there is still some shine. Like you can see the light catch it, right? There's still some shine, but it's not reflective. It, it, and it feels sturdier. It feels like it's gonna stay on the cards. It's still pretty, it still looks metallic, but it's just a little bit dulled down and that dulled down, that sort of antiqued feeling to it, it just, I just think it's a lovelier effect and it's much more comfortable to shuffle. It doesn't feel so sharp and pokey. And probably one of my favorite examples of this are the edges of the Tolku Oracle. This one has a chocolate brown edge here that has a slight shimmer to it. Again, ever so slight. I believe this was described as a sparkly uh, gilding. However, it is not glittery. It does have a little bit of sparkle when the light catches it. So it's got that sheen that's really lovely. It makes it look kind of metallic and special. It's not just a flat color, but it's really yummy. It's really yummy looking. It's really pretty. Uh, and again, not pokey because it's not that sort of mirror-like shine. Like when you see something like this, next to the mirror-like shine of the Sasserai Bito, you can really see the difference. This one feels really sharp. This one doesn't at all. But lastly, let's talk about flat matte color gilding, or that's what I'm calling it, flat matte. So this is a pure matte color only. This is the Sparkly Lenormand, and it has this really pretty pink matte gilding on it. No sheen or shine whatsoever. It's just a color. It's a very similar effect to those of us who will literally edge our cards, which when you hear people talking about that, edging a card is when you take ink, a marker, or an ink pad or something, and you take each card and you color the edges yourself. It's something a lot of us like to do to modify our decks. And in reality, that is the softest feel. Um, on the sides. If you want color on the sides and you don't want any of that like roughness against your fingertips or sharpness, then coloring your own edges is a great way to accomplish that. But I do really love matte colored edges. So that is my take on gilding. But there's more than just gilding to pretty up your decks. So here's an example of a deck that has a holographic coating on the front of the cards. So you see the rainbow across the whole front. It hasn't been applied in just specific areas, but the whole front has that rainbow 
effect. This is the Reflective Tarot by US Games. Um, and that's a lovely way you could potentially add some bling to your cards. But also, so this card from Cat Print, this shows a matte card stock that has had some foil applied right around the card. Most foil accents that you'll see on, on cards is applied through a method called hot foil stamping. Hot foil stamping is exactly what it sounds like. Foil is applied to a plate, some kind of a device, like a metal device that will push down and actually stamp the foil onto the card, applying heat and pressure. That's really interesting to note. So an example of that might be our Luminous Void Tarot here. You see how there's this foil applied on matte cardstock? This, is a, this, this one does have a bit of that soft touch feel. Um, the foil here has been stamped. And one of the reasons I know the foil has been stamped is because you can physically feel the slight indentations from where the foil was applied to the card. So I can slightly feel the rays of the sun or the rays of this light that go around the card. It's a beautiful effect, particularly on soft touch because soft touch has no reflection to it whatsoever. So the foil really pops, super pretty. But I did actually find on one of the decks that I owned, I believe it was the Marshmallow Marseille. It had a really beautiful foil stamped design on the back, but when you turned the card over, sometimes you could actually see the indentation from that stamping process on the front of the card, which was something I found personally distracting. And it's interesting to note because it's applied with a stamp. My favorite kind of foil accent that is applied to cards is the way that Baba Studios does it. And this is the cold foil stamping method. What's really fascinating about the cold foil stamping method, you can see all the foil, all the beautiful little foil accents on every card. This is the Alice Tarot by Baba Studios. The interesting thing about cold foil stamping is that it's produced in line, they say. So essentially a UV adhesive is applied to the cards in specific targeted areas. And you can program it, I'm assuming, to print much like you can color. So they can say, okay, I want cold foil stamping in these places and I want it to be this color and all of that stuff, just like you would with ink. And then I'm assuming it's cured after that. So the, when I looked it up, it basically said that foil is dispensed from a roll that is mounted in the production line and it's then laid over the substrate, so the actual card itself, which has a UV adhesive printed in the desired pattern. So it's like you can print the, desire, the pattern of that cold foiling on the card where you want it, and then they actually have a roll of foil and it applies it throughout the printing process. So cool to me. Um, and then they, they do a pressure roller after that. So the pressure roller then seals the foil to the sheet before they expose it to a UV lamp to cure the adhesive and lock the design in place. Now that's what I, I got when I did some research on the process, but the cold foil stamping can be a lot more detailed. Like look here we have in the wallpaper behind Alice. It's absolutely a breathtaking effect. And to my knowledge, Baba Studios is currently the only tarot deck creator using this method, but the effect is absolutely beautiful. It doesn't seem to apply any kind of texture to the cards, so it, it seamlessly integrates with the artwork in just a gorgeous, gorgeous way. Now, another thing you could do to add pop is spot gloss. So I hear it most often referred to as spot gloss, but it can also be called UV gloss. It can be called gloss varnish. So here's some examples from Cat Print. So here's an example of a card that has spot UV, so it's a UV cured varnish. And you can see we've got a matte card stock and then we've got these spots of gloss. That is spot gloss, quite literally on this example card actually. Another example of that is here, we have spot UV on matte laminated. So this one is on a matte varnish card and this one is on a matte laminated card. Very similar effect, right? You can see how it adds shine and pop really, really pretty. So a super unique way, super, very, very recently that I've seen spot gloss or UV gloss used is in the Location Tarot, which is was recently on Kickstarter. Uh, I believe the campaign has ended, but this is a deck that has, by the way, a beautiful um, matte flat black edging on it, which is gorgeous matte gilding, matte black gilding. So right now it looks like just a scene, but when you tilt it into the light, there we go, we have the figure of the fool appearing in the light. This is a deck creator who decided to use the spot gloss technique to create these invisible figures in the tarot deck. It's just a breathtaking and innovative way to use that technique of UV gloss or spot gloss accent. 
I would definitely be remiss if I didn't at least briefly speak on borders. <laughs> so whether your cards are bordered or borderless seems to be a matter of great contention in the tarot community. Some people love borders, some people hate borders, some people like me sometimes like them and sometimes don't like them. But let's talk about what we mean by that. So there's a few different ways I've seen borders handled. We have full borderless, often called full bleed. This is where the artwork goes all the way out to the edges of the cards, such as in Danny's Mystic Masters Tarot, no borders at all. We've also sometimes see partial borders or banners along the bottom of a card, such as we have here with the Playful Heart Tarot. So we have kind of a partial border, just, just breaking up the bottom. The uh, Mons Tarot is also like this. You can also have a soft kind of raw edge style border, such as we have in the Oak, Ash, and Thorn. Here we have this very soft, almost like this is the edge of the actual watercolor painting. It's got a very organic kind of feel to it. Really pretty, but still frames the artwork. You also can have a very classic border, such as in the This Might Hurt Tarot. We have a very clear outline around the card. There's a white border around the outline, just like that. You can even have borders like this one. In the, in the Alice Tarot, where the borders are treated like a suggestion. They look like they're very classic, but as you can see, certain elements of the card seem to pop out from the borders, and I actually really love this effect. It gives the card this feeling like it's, it's actually three-dimensional. It brings an element of sort of realism and dimension to the card, which is super cool. Like here we have things happening down here. There seems to be, in many of the cards, something popping out. Here we have the elbow of our white rabbit popping out the corner here, as well as like a fan over to the side. Here her shoulder is popping out over the border. It's like she's coming out through the card. It's such a cool effect. But regardless of whether you prefer bordered, borderless, or some mix of the above, borders do serve a function, right? They're intended to frame the artwork, but sometimes we don't want to frame. We want to see the artwork as big and beautiful as possible, but it will definitely affect the final impression of your deck if it has borders or it doesn't have borders. Some of us, if we, do, if we don't like the borders, we'll just trim them off. And in a case like this, where you have a very clean cut border, you could pretty easily trim the excess border off this card. It would affect the design on the backing, but you could trim, and you'll see that people in our tarot community do that pretty regularly. But I, for example, would never trim a card like this where the borders are being interacted with, or a one like this where the borders have this very raw kind of organic feel. And I probably wouldn't feel the need to cut the bottoms off of a deck like this. But I have had decks that are incredibly detailed that I feel like could have benefited from either being just bigger cards in general or having no border so that I could see more of the imagery. Before I get into my absolute final thoughts, I just wanted to say thank you to everybody who helped make this video possible. It was only through the sheer generosity in sharing information from the Indie Deck Creators community that I was able to gather as much information in this video as I was able to gather. I had so much help. So many people reached out to share their deck specifications, what printers they used, like what all of the things were that they had on their paperwork. But one thing became really clear when I was speaking to the Indie Deck community was that even among deck creators, there was so much confusion on this topic. There seemed to be a lack of clarity and a lack of a combined place where people could get a general idea of all these different card factors. And I hope that in some way, this video will give back to the Indie Deck Creators community for all that they gave to me so that I could make this video for you guys. I also want to especially thank Shuffled Ink, who were an invaluable resource. They are a printer that I contacted to see if they'd be willing to send me some samples and they just went above and beyond and I really appreciated their help. They answered questions for me. They sent me samples not once but twice to make sure that I had what I needed for this video and I genuinely really appreciated their help. There was also some really fantastic help from Print Ninja. I will have a full list of resources of everybody who helped me and their links that I could remember that I managed to get their names. I will put all of that information in the downloadable for you and I will try to have a full list of those links as well in the description box below. I'm sure that I've missed somebody along the line. I was getting messages through email and Facebook and Instagram and YouTube and it was fantastic. But I tried to get everybody into my spreadsheet so I could keep track. If I've missed you, please know that I'm so, so thankful for your help. It meant so much. So let me give you some of my final thoughts. If you are a card nerd like me, you have no intention of making a product, you just like geeking out on this stuff, I have to say that my biggest takeaway from this whole deep dive was that it's so complex. 
it's not nearly as simple as, oh, this is a 310 GSM card and this is a 330 GSM card, or this one's thick or this one's thin. It's so much more complicated. You have to look at the deck as a whole to really understand what your experience of it is going to be like. One conversation that's been happening a lot in tarot lately is the rising price of indie decks, but I think some of that is coming from our rising demands as consumers for higher and higher quality. But also as a, as a consumer or a collector, I think it's really helpful to know what's important to you. If you wanna have a really nice slide or shuffle, maybe you wanna sacrifice that super matte finish. You might want gilding because you love how pretty it is, but it hurts your hands when you shuffle. And all of these things I think are important to think about when you're considering purchasing a deck or backing a deck on Kickstarter. And I think having a general understanding of these different factors also helps you understand when a creator is saying, these are the things we're offering in our deck, what that means and what you're paying for. And I think that kind of knowledge is helpful to have. We don't always consider the whole picture. And I hope that this video at least gives all of us a better idea of what that whole picture kind of looks like and that it's actually made up of so many different moving parts. Maybe we have a better understanding now that it's much more nuanced than 350 GSM or 300 GSM. And I've certainly been guilty of that. I was like, oh, this is this GSM, it must be good. And it's not quite that simple. And that's what I've taken away from this entire experience. And I hope that I can share with all of you. At the end of the day, this stuff all comes down to personal preference. What is it you want in a tarot deck? How do you plan to use it? And that will determine what qualities are important to you. Now I have some very special tips specifically for people who are planning to create a deck of cards of any kind. One thing I've definitely learned is there is so much information and so much variety out there that it can be incredibly overwhelming. It was incredibly overwhelming for me to make this video and try to get all the information as accurate as possible, let alone trying to consider what factors were most important to me if I were to create a product. So if you are in that place where you're thinking about making a deck and you're feeling really overwhelmed, take it one little bite at a time. And my advice to you based on my experience doing this would be to Make a bit of a bucket list. Figure out what your absolute, like if money was no object, if you had the biggest budget for your project as possible, what features would you want in your deck? And then think about what your bottom of the barrel bare minimum is. What will you be at minimum satisfied with as a creator for your product and for, for the experience you want your end user to have? And then from there, find a sweet spot in the center. And then you have some room to play and you have some knowledge when you're speaking to printers about what's important to you. And you know that before you've signed contracts, before you've gotten in too far, and you can really plan out what it is you wanna do. I also cannot stress enough how important it is to get your hands on samples, and they're not hard to get. Just in making this video, these are the sample kits I requested. I reached out to local business card companies who sent me samples like this that have different kinds of cards that you can feel and touch, see how the, the, the thickness is, what the coatings feel like, what the experience of it is. I actually reached out to three different business card companies. Club Card was one. Printing Frog was where I got um, all of these really wonderful cards from, as well as one called Cat Print. That's where all of these came from. Make Playing Cards will send you a sample, you saw we cut into some of those in this video, of what all of their cards feel like. Um, I also received samples, as I mentioned, from Shuffled Ink. They sent me samples of, they even have a dry erase coating, who knew? Um, they have a premium smooth coating that's just lovely to touch. They're ultra smooth, lovely to touch. They even sent me box samples. Here's a soft touch and a smooth. I mean, you can get, here's what the Print Ninja one looks like. It opens up into this great pamphlet. You've got all these cards you can pull off and feel and play with. With, and all this information about what all the different cards are, what they're like, what, they, what they're what they for, what they mean. Sorry, they're sticking because I had glue here. But tons of information about the company, about all the different considerations, size, all of this kind of stuff. It's, it's not all that hard to get samples. And if you don't know what these things actually feel like or how they handle, getting samples will make all of the difference. Some printers will even send you full sample products for you to get your hands on. Here's some examples of some of those that I got in the preparation of this video. The creator of the location tarot sent me the deck so that I could share with you that really cool spot gloss technique. And the printers that I worked with sent me sample decks that had the specs of the cards on them so that I could really feel them. They sent me copies of games or of decks. 
so that I could really feel what the different kinds of cardstock feel like and how they operate and how they shuffle. So if you're a creator, don't be afraid to reach out to other creators to ask them about their experiences and the things that they've learned. Don't be afraid to reach out to printers and ask your questions or ask for samples. Some of them will charge for samples and some of them will offer them to you for free. It will just depend on their policies and how they're set up. But I definitely encourage you to reach out and don't feel like you have to go through it blind. There are so many people out there that can help you if you just raise your hand and say help I just need help that's all I did in the making of this video and so many people reached out it was such an incredibly heartwarming experience to see how many people were willing to help me just simply make a video that's my that's my takeaway is don't be afraid to ask questions but for everybody who stuck it out through this video with me who geeked out on cardstock and all of the nerdy details of the bones of tarot and oracle decks thank you so so much i really appreciate you putting your eyeballs on the space if you enjoy content all about tarot and oracle decks please be sure and subscribe i make lots of videos about tarot and oracle and magic and all the things and if you do subscribe, be sure and hit the bell and click all notifications so you get those notifications when I put up new videos or I go live and whatnot. And to everybody watching this video, thank you so, so much. And may your magic always shine from the inside out. Bye, guys.